Congratulations. This is kind of a review of the definitions. Solutions are defined as homogeneous or homogeneous mixtures of two or more pure substances. The solvent is present in the greatest abundance or the greatest amount. And anything else dissolved in there is considered to be a solute. And in some solutions, you might have more than one solute involved. And also remember, while taking notes, we're not writing every little thing. These are bullets. These are quick. Okay. If you have already know the definitions, you probably don't need to rewrite them down or anything. Okay. All right. Water. Water is the most important solvent substance on Earth, especially to us biological creatures that 70% of our body is made up of. And it can dissolve many different substances because, you know, it's a polar molecule and has this unequal charge distribution. Okay. So speaking of water, before we go through like the properties, let's take a look at the two shapes here. Here's showing you up here, this is the ball and stick model. Okay, so we have our bent shape molecule over here. Bent shape, also 3D version here, over here in this picture. And it gives you the purple lone pairs here. The lone pairs, they actually take up a lot of the space, so they're pushing those hydrogens downward giving you this 105 angle here. We use these little notations right here. Those are uh, lowercase delta signs. I don't know if you're familiar with them. But this means partial positive. This means partial negative. The electrons are spending more time around the oxygen. So this side of the molecule is going to have the pole that's negative. This side of the molecule where the H's are, they're going to be slight positive giving us a two-sided molecule, dipole, one positive, one negative. And by doing so, it creates um, lots of properties, unique properties to water, okay? So let's discuss some of those properties that you can recall. Anyone have a property they remember from before? Yes. Cohesion and adhesion, both are good properties, yes. Cohesion meaning it sticks to itself. And adhesion sticks to other stuff. Cohesion can also be considered a part of another property that water does. Especially fun for the insects. High surface tension, good. High surface tension because it's sticking to itself, so creating that little bit of force that the bugs can sit on. How about adhesion? That also creates a fun one, like up straws and things. Capillary action. See, I can think of these things. You just have to be reminded. Okay, so those kind of cover the adhesion, cohesion, great properties. What are some other ones of water that are very important and sort of unique? Yes. Um, they form hydrogen bonds? Well, they, they do form hydrogen bonds, and that allows them to have this cohesion and adhesion property, and also some of the other things, but um, that's more of a characteristic of the shape and the um, molecules uh, attracting to one another versus an actual property that it results from that. What could be another property? That's kind of important and why all the fish in the ocean, especially up north, don't die in the wintertime. Yes? Um, was it low specific heat or high specific heat? High specific heat is, is the correct one, yes, and I'll explain what that is. That wasn't the one I was going for, though. So in the winter, where did it, where's the ice? On the top. Why? Expands when it freezes, so that makes it Less dense than the liquid. That's the one I was going for, but we're going to talk high, high specific heat too. So we have the, the um, less dense as a solid. That one's kind of important. Okay. And the high specific heat. <coughs> Let's 
left here. <laughs> Does everybody remember what high specific heat means or high heat capacity? I'm sorry. Uh, yes, it, it will take a uh, It will have to absorb lots of energy before it's actually going to change its temperature. So, you know, specific heat is, you know, the 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius that you remember last year. That was, you know, to raise one gram, one degree Celsius. But in general, to make water change its temperature, either up or down, you have to absorb a lot of heat to make it go up, or you have to release a lot of heat for it to go down. Okay? And, you know, the specific heat of water being 4.184, whereas a lot of the metals are like 0.29. So they heat up real quick, but they also cool down very fast. So they absorb and release heat very, very quickly, not with small amounts, whereas water needs lots of amounts. That's where it actually helps us with our climate, right? Because we live near the ocean. And the ocean, you know, it takes like three months for it to eventually change. So you can still go to the beach in October and go in the water because the water's still warm. It doesn't really start to cool down until about December. And then you try to go, you know, we, say for instance, we're getting out early this year, right? June 15th. Everybody's going to go rush off to the beach. Are you going to go running into that water? No, because it's going to be really cold still. In June, the water is still pretty cold because it hasn't, you know, had July and August to heat up. So that's why lots of people like to go to the beach in August because the water's nice and warm. Okay? So keep in mind that's what we're talking about when the, the specific heat absorbing and releasing lots of heat before it's going to change its temperature. Okay, so we're talking about lots of those uh, wonderful properties. Did everybody have a chance also to draw the water and describe its geometry, the bent shape? Before we move on, everybody remembers that bent shape, the two lone pairs, two things attached to the central atom, creating that polar molecule which is asymmetrical. So, um, that also kind of answers the why is water polar? It's not symmetrical. Uh, what's the other main point about that? Oxygen is very what? In comparison to other elements on the table. Actually, it's the second highest in this. Only chlorine beats it out fairly. Well, it's very reactive, probably because it has this uh, quality. Yes, what was that? It's high electronegativity. Chlorine is 4.0, oxygen is 3.5. Everything else, nitrogen and chlorine come in a close second at like 3.0. So everything else is, so electronegativity is the ability to, to grab onto electrons in a compound. And um, by, it's kind of like the electron bully here, wanting to hold it close, okay, close in. And because of that, the um, electrons actually spend more time. We, we draw, draw in these things called dipole moments because they're going to spend their time mostly around the oxygen. And we'll look at it again um, in, in, on the next slide in a minute. But um, remember those um, electronegativity scales 0 to 0.4 was like nonpolar, 0.5 to 1.6 is where you got polar. but 0.5 was just slightly polar, 1.6 was almost ionic, right? Almost a full charge shift. Well, I believe the electronegativity is somewhere like 1.4, 1.5, I had to recalculate it. But uh, it's very close to that ionic. So the electrons spent very little time around the really small, tiny hydrogens. They don't have a whole lot of pull um, and causes this big dipole. And then gets into the, the ability to do that hydrogen bonding. Because the electronegativity difference is so big, it creates a stronger force than just a regular dipole-dipole force because it's almost ionic. There's almost a full shift in charge, like the oxygen almost keeps it solely around it, and the hydrogens are almost like complete plus ones here, okay? So uh, keep that in mind as you're, as we're looking here. And we talked about the asymmetrical. We talked about the little delta signs here. So you might see these notations. Those just mean partial charges. But so, for instance, if you had, you know, like carbonate with the minus 2, that's a full charge. So 
Those would be full charges, whereas these little delta signs on molecules will tell you that those are partial charges. They're not as strong. Those ionic full transfer charges, those Coulombic attraction forces are in the, you know, way higher in strength. Okay? So keep that in mind, too. An ionic solid dissolves in water because of its polar nature. Notice how water molecules become attached to the ions of a sodium chloride crystal in the process called hydration. Positively charged sodium ions attract the partial negative charge of the oxygen in water. A similar attraction occurs between negatively charged chloride ions and the hydrogen atoms, which have a partial positive charge. These interactions loosen the attractions between the ions in the crystal, dislodging them from the crystal. Additional water molecules surround the released ions, insulating them from attraction to other ions. Okay, so we're seeing the dissociation. We're seeing the hydration here. We're adding water and it's pulling it apart and surrounding the individual ones. As you see here, um, the chlorines are the green. So I'm going to draw it a little bit bigger so you can tell. And the sodiums are the smaller ones. But, and they're very particular about having you draw the circles. That's why it's in your lab and that's why it's up here. But the sodiums are going to have the oxygen sides facing inward, because that's the partial negative side. And as they surround it, okay, so forth. You know, so eventually it would completely surround it. Therefore, the sodiums will be attracted to the other, the chloride. The chlorides will also have stuff surrounding them, except for the hydrogen sides face inward. Okay, I know my Mickey Mouse ears are kind of pathetic, but... These are supposed to be waters. So the little hydrogen space in, the oxygen space out, and they surround them. So this is hydrating it. It's also called solvation. You know, the solvent is doing the, you know, getting it to dissolve and break apart. And those hydrogen bonds, those dipole forces, tracking to the positive or negative part of the crystal and eventually pulling apart those ionic forces, okay? is why this is going to be soluble, why sodium chloride does dissolve. If those ionic forces, that Coulombic attraction is stronger, um, the, the ionic bond won't break. And that's where we see some of them are insoluble, where they do not dissolve. Because that ionic force is too strong, so the um, hydrogen bonding, the dipole force, um, dipole ion interaction is too weak to pull it apart. Okay, so basically what you're seeing here is adding that water, breaking apart the crystal, and, and hydration in general is just adding water to two things, so keep that in mind. So in this case, that word solvates, that solvates is that adding the water, surrounds them with the water, that hydration process. And we call it dissociation, separating and dissociating. And in this case, because sodium chloride will dissociate, it is soluble because it can pull apart that ionic bond between the sodium and the chloride. Whereas other things that you know are insoluble based off your solubility rules, they won't dissolve and they wouldn't dissociate. Okay. And we're going to go into the degrees of the solubility later on because it is a gradient just like the bonding, you know, the intermolecular forces to ionic, that's a big gradient. So these diagrams and these being able to draw these little circle things, very important, especially for the AP exam and for tests. So you try to get in that, you know, looking at it from the molecular atomic level. Okay, so another picture showing the hydration where the water, and you see these little partial delta signs here, these guys, okay, sodium chloride, and then of course over here is the electronegativity difference scale. Here we have our nonpolar stuff, our symmetrical stuff, and then we have starting the polar, getting you up to the ionic, which is the completely full charge Coulombic attraction. These little arrow things, we call them dipole moments because it just shows that the electron density is spent more around one particular atom. So the arrow points to the side where more of the electrons spend their time creating the dipole. 
here, this is just a complete charge uh, distribution. So this one's completely negative over here. This one's completely positive over here. And because of that charge, now they're attracted to each other. That's the coulombic electrostatic force pulling them together. Okay. All right. So there is the, the diagram there for you also drawn. Um, before we head over to the electrolyte stuff, um, let's also go back one more slide, excuse me. And since we were over here looking at our gradient, let's talk about polar versus nonpolar and being able to dissolve in different substances. Does anybody know what the phrase is that we should fill in this little bullet here? On the back? Are we not there yet? Because no. right, we cover when something is soluble and something's insoluble, right? We got that part. No, didn't get that part. When is something soluble? Was when you saw in this little video how the water would surround, you know, the sodium. So oxygen side would surround the sodium and be able to pull it apart. That is that um, dipole ionic force pulling it apart. That makes it soluble because it's breaking the ionic bond between the sodium and the chloride, holding it together. And it's allowing it to be surrounded by waters. See what I'm saying? Now, the insoluble ones, what did I say? Happens when something will just not dissolve and stick to the bottom and stay a crystal. Why is that happening? Yes, sir. The ionic bond, that electrostatic force, that coulombic attraction is stronger than the dipole ionic bond trying to pull it apart. Right? So say something like what? Lead to chloride is insoluble. But if you put it into the water, it stays together as a crystal because the coulombic attraction between the lead and the chlorine or the chloride is too strong. So the water is going to try to pull it apart, but it doesn't have enough force. Those partial charges on the water don't have enough force to pull it apart. Whereas in the sodium chloride, guess what happens? The water, this little dipole hydrogen bonding force, can come along, start surrounding them, and it has the ability to pull them apart and break that ionic bond. So anything else on the front that I didn't cover? Just want to make sure we're all there. What is hydration? Anyone? What did we get for hydration? Hydration is adding water. water. Adding water solvates and surrounds the ionic particles here, like sodium chloride, pulling it apart. So we're adding water to it. Okay? And it's, it's dissolving. Also, if you want to think about it in terms of hydration um, from like your hydrate labs from last year, you know, you probably like dehydrated it and the crystal turned to color and then when you put the water back on, it went back to having the color. That's, you know, another form of hydration and we're specifically looking at the dissolving aspect today. Okay? okay. So do we have everything on the front? Good. Just make sure everything's answered before you move on. And like I said, stop me. Don't be afraid to ask. You missed something along the way. We will come back to it. All right. Yes. Why is water polar? Who knows the answer to that? Yes. Because uh, the charges are distributed um, like um, it's because it's asymmetrical, and it was an imbalance of the charge, and then it um, yeah, so it creates a polar charge. Yes. Yeah, so that's asymmetrical. Also, the oxygen's doing what? Um, so the lot remember the oxygen is highly electronegative, so it's having the electrons surround it more often. So the electron density, the electrons spend more time around the oxygen, so that side of the molecule is going to be slightly negative. Whereas the hydrogens are super small too, they don't have a lot of power, they're not highly electronegative. So they don't get to have the electrons as often, they don't get a lot of that density. So their side of the molecule are going to be slightly positive. So remember, polar molecules, the electrons don't, they're not equal sharing. They're, they're, they're over spending more time around one particular atom. 
than the other. Whereas in nonpolar stuff, where are the electrons going to be? Evenly distributed. They pretty much stay equally around all the atoms. And that's why we're about to get into like the ability to dissolve here. Okay? And your picture here, water um, being able to dissolve ionic substances, because ionic substances form charges, so they can surround and have that ion like dipole force going on. But what about stuff like ethanol? Because we did that in our lab where we took the water and dissolved it in the ethanol. What happened there? It mixed really well, right? Why? If we look at the structure of ethanol, ethanol has what? Hydrogen bonding too, because it has that OH bond. So it's going to have a partial positive side and a partial negative side. So the partial negative sides will attract to the hydrogen side of the water. The partial positive side will attract to the oxygen side of the water, and it can and dissolve very easily. However, what do we know doesn't mix with water at all? Oil doesn't mix with water at all. Good. Why does the oil not mix with water? Oil is nonpolar. It's all hydrocarbons, basically. Long chains of hydrocarbons. So in hydrocarbons, H's and C's, there's not a huge electronegativity difference, right? So the electrons kind of spend an equal amount of time around everything. There isn't one side of the molecule that's slightly positive, one side that's slightly negative. And therefore, it's not going to, you know, be able to dissolve. It layers out. So that brings me to that, like, fats do not, do not dissolve in water since they're nonpolar. And our quotation is, the useful rule of being able to tell whether it's going to dissolve is like dissolves like. Okay? Like dissolves like. So, if you know something is uh, nonpolar, it will dissolve in like oil. It will dissolve in some of the other, what, benzene's another liquid that's a nonpolar solvent. There's some other ones out there. We don't usually think of our nonpolar so solvents because we don't use them very often. We always use water. So we're always looking at stuff that's polar or stuff that um, is ionic in nature because that can dissolve in water. Okay, but there are nonpolar solvents out there. You don't want to go near benzene though because that stuff's pretty toxic. But they use it in industry all the time in order for manufacturing. Okay? But like dissolves like. Okay? So that, that one's just a kind of a quick little rule from, from last year. Now, nature of aqueous solution, strong and weak electrolytes. Are we all there? We're all good? Going back over electrolyte, substance that dissociates into ions. Into ions. That's the important part. We need those charged particles in the solution. Everybody do the light bulb thing last year? Did the light bulb demo, stuck it in there? Okay, what would happen if it was a solution that had a strong electrolyte? The light bulb would light up and be very bright, right? Because the charged particles were floating around the solution, so when you put the electricity through, it could line up those electrons and allow the electricity to flow. Because really, electricity is just a stream of electrons. Okay? A non-electrolyte, though, may dissolve, but does not dissociate into ions. Anybody remember some examples like that? That dissolve, but don't light up the light bulb. Yes? Sugar. Sugar dissolves, but it just stays that one particle. It doesn't dissociate. It doesn't have the partial charges. Okay? Pretty much most of your non-electrolytes are going to be molecular compounds, like ethanol or uh, sugar, things that will dissolve but don't really form ions. Okay? So, strong electrolytes. There's a few in this category. Soluble ionic compounds, so the ones that are soluble, like sodium chloride, anything that says soluble on the solubility rules will work. Other ones are going to be strong acids, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Strong bases work too. Okay. 
because they break apart and they have charges floating around those ions floating around in the solution so they can conduct the electricity. So speaking of this, how would, what would we need to know to figure out if it's a soluble salt? What do we need to know? Where would you go for that information? <laughs> to determine whether the salt is soluble or not. What do we need to refer to? It's in your summer assignment packet. Those solubility rules. If you look on it, if it says that it is soluble, then it's going to be a soluble ionic salt and be a strong electrolyte. If you looked on your solubility rules and it said insoluble, then it's going to be what? Non-electrolyte. It's not going to dissolve enough really to conduct electricity. Okay? So, molecular compounds tend to be the non-electrolytes except for acids and bases. And now we're going to get into that. Like I said, molecular compounds are like your sugar and your ethanol. Okay? But so let's talk about the acids and the bases now. Strong acids, strong bases, ionic salts. Okay. Strong acids completely dissociate. And in your packet for the summer assignment, does anybody remember the seven strong? Because those of you do need to have memorized by the test date. Okay, you do need to know your seven strong. Strong acids, anyone? Anybody want to offer one of the seven? Yes? Hydrochloric is one of the seven. Good. What else? Anybody? Yes? Uh, that one, in that case, it would just be sulfuric because it's from sulfate. So if you remember, you're naming your acids. What it ends in ATE, you just do um, the beginning with ic. Hydrosulfuric would look like that. It would just be with sulfide. Okay? So that, would, that one is actually considered a weak acid, by the way. Yes? Chloric. Yes. You like chloric. What also goes with chloric? Well, chlorate is the uh, polyatomic involved, but there's chloric and perchloric, which is just add an oxygen. So add the four there. Perchlorate turns into chloric acid, perchloric acid, yes? Hydrobromic, HBr. <coughs> nitric is also, yes, I used that a lot last week. That's with nitrate. Don't forget the H there. And let's see here, one, two, three, four. So we have one left. <coughs> yes. Yes, hydroiodic. Okay. So, for remembering your naming for acids, the ones that go by the IDE ending, the anions that are IDE ending, this would be like chloride right here, bromide, iodide. They get the hydroic. So, hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic. These guys, the end is H. Remember, you leave off the hydros. So, it's sulfuric, chloric, perchloric, and nitric. Okay, those are your seven strong. Those are the ones they want you to have memorized for the AP exam. There are a few organic ones that are pretty strong, but they will tell you up front. But you assume everything else is weak. So like acetic acid is weak. Citric acid is weak. Um, hydrofluoric, that's the only halogen that's weak, by the way. Hydrofluoric, HF. Okay. So you assume everything else besides these seven ones are weak, okay? And I'll just advance here so now you can see them all nicely listed. Our strong bases are a little bit easier to remember because they're all the group 1A metal hydroxides. So lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, potassium, rubidium, and cesium hydroxide. And the group 2A metals that are heavy, calcium, strontium, barium hydroxide. Those ones are considered your strong bases, and they're the ones that they say completely dissociate. The other thing to remember, too, is about sulfuric. 
Sulfuric has two H's on it. It's a, a diprotic acid, right? So if you pull off one H, you're going to get, like so, this would be the reaction. You're going to get this, what, bisulfate or hydrogen sulfate in betweener. It's only the first H that's strong. This guy stays together and is a weak acid. It could also be a weak base because it can donate or accept the hydrogen. But uh, when we think about the second H on sulfuric, we always remember that that one's weak. It's only the first H that completely dissociates. The second H stays attached. And we'll go into that in more detail when we get to the acids and bases unit. So just kind of, you know, getting you back into acid-base chemistry here. Remember, it's all about the H donating, accepting the H, whether it's acid or the base, the bronsted lowry definition, and so forth. But here we're looking for, because the acids and the bases are solution chemistry, whether or not they dissociate, do they form the ions in the solution, or do they stay together and not form the ions in the solution? or only partially dissociate, where a few of them will form ions, but some, most of them stay together, okay? So if you're looking at your examples at the bottom, you see the barium chloride. That one will dissolve completely. The sodium hydroxide will completely dissociate. You see they're all separate particles with charges in there. And HCl also, a little bottom diagram, they separate, they separate and you have the charges in there, okay? But let's take a look at the weak ones. Yes. Barium. The heavy ones in group two. Calcium, strontium, and barium are going to be your strong ones. And I forgot those questions on the next page, but whatever. So if you write them down to the bottom, it's fine. You don't need to rewrite them over here then. But let's look at weak electrolytes. Weak electrolytes only partially dissociate, or they only have a few dissolved salts in them, like Gatorade. Yes? Um, back on the strong acids, uh -huh. so that question you know just because the second You just have to memorize it. Yes, that's exactly right. Unfortunately, there's no other way to, there's no other real system. I, what I try to do is I try to like group the three halogen ones together, hydrochloric, hydrobromide, hydroiodic. I group those ones together. And then just got to remember hydrofluoric's not in there. Perchloric and chloric go together because it's just one oxygen difference there. This HCl3 is, is chloric. Adding an oxygen gives it that per prefix. I don't know if you guys remember that on the polyatomics last year where you had like um, hypochlorite versus chlorite versus chlorate versus perchlorate. That's all about the oxygen number. So chlorate has three. Chloride has two. Hypochloride has one oxygen on it. Per is going the other way, so you add an oxygen. So those little prefixes and then the ice versus the ace, ice always have one oxygen less than the eight version of that particular polyatomic. I don't know if you remember that from last year, but that's good things to review in terms of, so if you memorize all your eights, you should know your ice because you just take an oxygen off. Does that make sense? Some of them, though, like thiocyanate, I mean, that was just a random one that doesn't really have a system, so you just kind of have to memorize. All right, here, looking at this particular slide, we're going to the weak ones. Only partially dissociates, and that's going to be your weak acids and bases. What do I mean by partial dissociation? See how some of them are staying together. They don't break apart. Okay? But a few of them actually did break apart. So there's only a few dissolved ions in here. Those green ones were the ones that broke apart. Everything else stayed together. So it only has a few ions floating around. So it's going to give you that dim light bulb if you put it in there. Okay? And, you know, we can create weak electrolytes like they manufacture for Gatorade. They put some potassium and sodium in there because <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say plus two. Okay. So they put they put those um, especially potassium and sodium in there because that replenishes our own system and those we need those ions for our nervous system and our our muscle system too, muscular system. So um, there's a few of them in there replenishing those because we sweat that out when we're working out. Okay. 
And you, if you were to put the light bulb in Gatorade, it's very dim, but it is a weak electrolyte in that kind of case there. Some other weak ones that you may not know about, um, for instance, hydrofluoric, because hydrofluoric is the only halogen that's not strong. Acetic acid, which is also written this way, I don't know if you've picked up on that. Acetic acid um, can also look like this. This is how we, we did it last year. But acetic acid, this is the organic way of writing acetic acid. It's also called ethanoic acid. But that's vinegar, very weak. And then the, one of the weak bases that I'm sure you've heard of is ammonia and H3. Okay. And it can accept hydrogens. But it only, you know, partially does it. It can pull off an H from water, creating some hydroxide. And um, it's a very weak base. Okay, so there's some examples for that uh, for you to be able to write down. But do notice the graphic here. Most of them stay together, only a few of them break apart, especially for those weak acids and bases. So besides your seven strong acids, besides your group one and your heavy group two ones, we're going to consider everything else weak for our purposes, okay? Everything else, else is considered weak. And you just you're going to keep it together. You won't break it apart. Okay. Ready to move on to some solution stoic chemistry. All right. Must know the nature of the reaction. So we're going to be focusing on today for precipitation reactions. The next two other section of notes will be looking at redox and acid base. Okay. Then you need to know the amounts present in order to determine, you know, how much product you're going to get, who's your limiting, who's your excess, all that good stuff. Okay. So how do we measure? Common measurements for concentration. We use molarity. Molarity is always the moles per liter, moles of the solute over the liters of solution. Okay, so what can you use here for the um, units of molarity? You can use the italicized big M, or you can actually write it as moles per liter, like a derived unit. And that derived unit, that moles per liter, you can use it as a conversion factor like you use density. So it's actually kind of handy sometimes to write it that way, moles over liter. Okay? Everybody remember this from last year? It's all good. Okay. Now, there are a few others that we um, use in chemistry, although they're not on the exam. There's one called molality. It's like a small m. Okay? And that's actually the uh, moles of the solute divided by the kilograms of the solvent. Now, we might briefly discuss later when we're talking about colligative properties, because molality is used in the calculation for boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. They used to do also do like percent by volume, percent by mass, but just, there were like five different ways to calculate concentration. Luckily, they made it simple for us. We're basically only going to be using molarity throughout the year, which is nice. But do know that there is percent by volume, there is percent by mass, there is molality. There are other ways to measure concentration, but for our purposes, we're going to be using molarity. Okay? Any questions on that? All right, how do we prepare solutions? We're going to be using these volumetric flasks quite often this year. One is a one liter or a thousand milliliters volumetric flask. And I use them to make up the solutions. They're quite nice and convenient. Instead of having to measure everything out in graduated cylinders. So if I want to make a liter of like 0.2 molar sodium chloride, well, I can figure out the grams of the sodium chloride by doing some stoichiometry calculations. 
put it on the scale. It's a little crystal. Stick a funnel on top here, right? Pour the crystals in here. And then it has a nice little line on the neck here. I'm sure you see these little lines on the neck. That's going to be the one liter mark for this one. You're going to be using 100s in the first lab, the percent by comp, uh, percent of brass, uh, percent of copper in brass lab. But here, if I want a one liter solution, I put the needed grams in here as you see it dissolving at the bottom. And that's where you put it. Then you just start filling with water, the deionized water, okay, or distilled water, but we have deionized water. And you, you fill it, you shake it, and you just keep going until you get to that line. And then you have your concentration. The volumetric flasks are very helpful in being able to do that. You're actually going to do a serial dilution for that one, and I'm going to show you how to do that. But you're going to make up the most concentrated one first, and then you're going to be able to do like 50-50 and dilute it down using your volumetric flask. But as we get closer to the, cop, the copper lab, we will go over that particular lab technique to make sure everybody's good with how to dilute, okay? So this is the kind of apparatus, a new thing to use. We used these a whole lot last year. You may have seen us using them to make the solutions, but uh, it's the quickest and easiest way to make the solutions using the volumetric flask, okay? All right, now let's do some fun example problems. And what I'm going to do here is I'll work a couple with you, and then I'm going to have you guys work some, and we'll get through the steps. Now, these problems and the exercises, examples and exercises, are supposed to be very comparable to what you'll see in the problem sets. Okay? So they're good references to go back to for steps. Also, I haven't said this before, but in your textbook, has everybody opened their textbook yet? Mm -hmm. There's these nice big blue sections that are example problems in there, and they go step by step of what you should do. That's also a very good resource when you're trying to work the problems. The textbook is your friend, I promise. Okay? This one's very basic. I feel, but let's go over the steps again. What's the first thing I need to do here? The moles of potassium phosphate. I do need to know the moles for my molarity equation. Because molarity, once again, remember, is moles divided by liters. Good. But before I can calculate the moles, what do I need to know? The molar mass of potassium phosphate. And before I can calculate the molar mass of potassium phosphate, what do I need to know? Formula. The formula of potassium phosphate. So as you can see, we have, we have to know all this stuff before we can even begin. So what is the formula for potassium phosphate? How do I figure that out? It is K3PO4, but why? Good. Now I know phosphate because I memorized that one. It's on my polyatomics, right? PO4, 3 minus. Everybody's got that. Potassium, how do we remember potassium's charge? Periodic table, it's in group one. Group one is always plus one. Good. Now I do my crisscross, right? So if I do my crisscross, I end up actually going to crisscross up K3PO4. Now I know the formula, so I know how to add up my molar mass. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to make my little train track. Okay. Diagonal down my grams to go to my moles. Okay. You have your periodic tables. We're going to do all of our molar masses to the hundredths. So potassium is going to be 39.10. Phosphorus is going to be 30.97. Oxygen is going to be 16.00. So we're all standardized using the same molar masses. That way we'll all get the same answers, okay? Even though, you know, if we use the different ones, we might have a slightly different rounding, okay? So 
the new time. And Chad, do you remember to correct me? I did tell you about how I transpose numbers, right? So, so I'll say like 89 out loud and I'll write down 98 by the state. So if you see that, brain's processing faster than you can write, I suppose. I don't know. So what we get for our molar mass? 212.27. That's what I got. So I've agreed with you. Now, one thing, does anybody have problems with their mastering chem and it keeps telling them that their significant digits are off and that it doesn't like the way you round it? Yes? No? Anybody? It does that to me all the time, by the way. Uh, because it wants you to do it at the very end. So, I know I need to make 1.50 liters of solution. I'm going to divide the moles by the liters, right? So let's put it in here and just make it easier and all in one track. Can I stick it there? Can I do it all in one big punch? That way I only round at the very end. Make sense? So you can multiply the top, multiply the bottom, or you know, basically just make it all one big calculation. And then we only do the rounding at the very end. Okay? So what do we get? 1.57 M, or you could put moles per liter, right? Okay. Voila. There we go, right? Good. Yes. So, are we always going to round to the hundreds? Because that's the Oh, okay. So, yeah, let's go over this. I did, did Very good question. Our first measurement has four. Our other measurement in the problem has three, though. Since we're multiplying and dividing, we go with the least number, and that's why we have three. But that's a good good thing to point out. Good question. Uh, yeah, I was getting a little ahead of myself there. So you have to take into consideration all of the measurements in the problem. Okay? There you go. Now let's look at the next example. Aha! This is where you probably knew this, but maybe never really thought of it this way. Okay. Sample two. 0.25 molar calcium chloride solution. What is the concentration of the calcium ions and the chloride ions in the solution? And then what would be the total concentration of all the ions? Okay. So if I took my calcium chloride solid and I stick it in water, What's it going to do? It's going to dissolve. It is soluble. It's, it is in the solubility side. So it's going to break apart into its ions, right? And this is AQ because it's aqueous now. It's, it's hydrated, solvated, surrounded by water. The chlorides, though, what should I have to put there in order to make sure we're balanced? Two, right? So every time this thing breaks apart, it's going to make one of those and two of those. So a total of how many ions? So three ions are, are being dumped into the solution every time one breaks apart. Does everybody see that? Because you probably didn't ever like look at it from this perspective before. Okay. So when I say I have 0.25 M solution, I'm talking about this guy, kind of before the dumping happens. So. How many calcium ions, then, in terms of molarity, are we going to have? So every time this, this calcium chloride solid crystal breaks apart, how many calciums are you going to make? Mm -hmm. One. So if you start out with 0.25 molar of it, there should be 0.25 molar of the calcium, right? Does that make sense? Because there's only one calcium coming out each time. So. This guy is going to be 0.25 molar. However, every time one crystal breaks apart, you're making two chlorides. So what happens there? It doubles. Good. So every time this calcium chloride crystal breaks apart, we're going to have two chlorides pop out. So what do we need to do to this guy? Double it. So this is going to be 0.50 molar, right? Now, Let's think about this. 
what would be the total then with all three ions floating around in there? You, would, you could do it one of two ways. Yes, you could add those two together and get your 0.75 molar because you have 0.25 of the calcium, 0.50 of the chlorides together. That makes up the total ions. Or you can realize that there's three ions per one. So what can you do with your 0.25? Multiply it by three and get your 0.75 molar. Sort of making sense? New way of looking at the dissolving solution chemistry. So for I'd like you to try example three now on your own. All right, so let's see how we did. Everybody do okay on this one? What's the first thing we need to make sure we write correctly? The formula for aluminum sulfate. So aluminum goes to what charge? Plus three. Plus three. It's in group 13 or 3A. I like the A groups, the tall groups. We call the A groups. Sulfate minus two. Okay, so Al2 SO4 three. If it's dissolving, you're going to get your ions. But the ratio is now different. This is going to be a two to a three ratio, as you notice. So if the crystal itself is two molar, then when it breaks apart, the aluminum should double, the sulfate should triple, and the total number of ions dumping into solution is, well, it's five times because there's two plus three there, right? So, as you can see, the aluminum you would double, the um, sulfate you would triple, and then you could do it one of two ways. You could add these two together, or you could do the five ions times the two molar. Either way works out. Right? Good so far? Get this down? Good. Moving on. All right. One little quick thing, because this will apply to a later question as well, but when you're thinking about solution chemistry, you can't always go by the greatest number of ions. You can't always go by the volume if the largest. Okay? You always have to double check your math, especially when you're comparing solutions. Okay? Because sometimes, you know, they embed these things to make them, you know, seem like they would have the greater concentration or the lesser concentration. But until you actually calculate it with the volume and the particles, figuring it out, um, you won't necessarily get the right answer just by trying to eyeball it. But let's go back to calculating a few more things. Calculate the molarity of the solution prepared by dissolving 11.5 grams of sodium hydroxide and that's water to make 1.50 liters of solution. I'll let you do exercise one on your own and exercise two on your own. What is the only, and anybody like just by looking at exercise two, what's the only little like trip up there in exercise two? They gave you milliliters, you need to convert it to liters first. So go ahead, do those two real quick. And we'll check our answers. <laughs> Generalized setup here. Three and three twos. So you start out with both threes. So your answer should end up having three. Now, I did put this note on here, rounding for sig figs at the end of the calculation, and you get a one sig fig plus or minus one sig fig rule for the AP exam. So like for instance, say they left off the two, you would still get credit. Or say you added the extra digit. So you were just off by one digit in either direction. They still give you credit for it. But if you don't do any rounding at all, they will take away the point. So make sure that you round and try to get the correct number of sig figs, but they allow you to have plus or minus one sig fig correct on the AP exam. Okay? So, so do make sure. We'll try to do that for the test too, but um, as we're correcting for your responses and so forth, but 
like some people last year would just leave their raw calculated answer and that's a no-go they will not give you the point for it okay does everybody get that answer good okay Quick change from milliliters to liters, divide by a thousand. Everybody get your setup? Yes, no, good. Okay, so let's check. Rounded correctly. Correct unit there. Feeling okay? Alright, now for the fun concept check one. On to the fun concept check. This is really applying that idea of looking at the volume and the particles and everything. How would you even approach this? What would we do here? Any idea? Yes, sir. Convert to moles. Good. Okay. So if we have our molarity equation, we can convert everything to moles, right? So... 1, 2, 3, that's 0.4 times 0.1, right? Because that would be uh, 0 0.10, 0 0.4000, oh, right? We would just do that quick multiplication, and we would get 0.04 moles, right? Actually, O, oh, because this one has 2, that one has 4, so I would keep it 0 0.040 moles, right? So, can we like quickly eyeball the others and, and, and calculate their moles as well? Yes. So if this is 0.3 times 0.1, this one's going to be, right? This would be 0.2 times 0.1, which is 0 0.020 moles. And last but not least, we have 0.8 times 0.1, which is 0 0.08 moles. Now, what's wrong? Oh, yes, and I did, forgot mine right here. Remember, those zeros in the front are not significant, right? Okay, am I done yet, though? Am I comparable yet? No, what's wrong? Well, I don't really need to know the grams. I'm looking for the ions and the greatest amount of ions in solution. What do I need to consider? How many ions are in each formula, right? How many ions in this one? There's two. Two. So, right? So every time I dump one of these in there, I'm going to produce two ions. So my moles need to be multiplied by two, right? So there's really like that many moles of ions in the solution. Okay? Talk about moles, we're talking about those particles dumped into the solution. How about this one? How many? Three. So we would multiply this by three and get 0 0.090 moles of ions floating around in solution. How about this one? So this one's four, right? So times four, because there's one iron, three chlorides, 0 0.080 moles of ions. And what about sucrose? What's sucrose again? Just sugar. Does sugar break apart into ions? So how many particles for every time we dump that in there? One particle, so this would be just multiplied by one. Moles of particles. So really not ions at all, but particles. What's the correct answer there? B. Would you have thought B just by looking at it? No, that's why calculating the volume and the number of particles, you got to consider all of it. 
So yes, T was the correct answer here. I know that was a tricky one, but they like to give you those kind of multiple choice ones. And you see how the math was kind of easy on that? That's like the non-calculator multiple choice type question. Remember, you don't get a calculator for the multiple choice part on the test. So, okay, this would be one of those where they expect you to be able to move the place value and do the math. All right. All right, so let's look at exercise three. I wanted to get through exercise five, but we might not get there. So give the concentration of each type of ion in the following solution. This is kind of reiterating what we just did. For those for exercise three, if you'd like to check. The cobalt only has one in the salt, so it's going to match the original. Thank you which is 0.50, since it's going to be every time it breaks apart, they're only going to produce one of the cobalt. If there's 0.5 to start with, there'll be 0.5 of the cobalt left. The nitrates, though, there are two for every time it breaks apart, so you would double it and get the 1.0. Down here for the iron 3 per chlorate. Once again, the iron is only going to have one each time, so it's going to match its original crystal amount. But the perchlorates, when it breaks apart, will produce three. So you'll end up with three molar of that. Okay? Does that make sense? Um, I'm not sure we'll get through exercise four, but try exercise four. One thing I'd like to show you about exercise four is you can use the equation, the molarity equation, no problem, right? You can plug and chug it backwards and solve for moles, right? But I want you to start getting used to using it as a conversion factor and set it up as a T-chart, okay? So if I have 1.75 liters of solution, I can do 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3 uh, moles over 1 liter. See, I can set it up as like dimensional analysis. Right? Just like you use density, you can cross the liters out and what do you end up with? So this is where you take that guy and make it moles over one liter. You see how I did that? You can do it either way. I don't care. If you, you, you like the equation, you can stick with that for now until you get more comfortable with setting it up dimensional analysis. Okay? But uh, the dimensional analysis way is very quick and easy, especially when you have to change it to grams and other things later on. Does that make sense? So that would be, you know, the two possible ways to set up exercise four. So let's go ahead and I'll just let you see the answer. Hopefully you got that down. Is that what you got? Oh, wait. Did I not? I didn't finish it. I only went to moles of zinc chloride. What else do I need to add on? So one mole of zinc chloride is going to give me two moles of chloride ions. You see how I did that? Because this, remember, when it breaks apart, it's going to have two chlorides for every one zinc. We will resume with exercise four next class.